Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn and I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com and the associated website. So uh, information, resources, activities for people who work in and around uh, medical communications, medical education, medical publishing and so on. Uh, these webinars are great. Uh, we can involve people from all over and we've got a good audience today and we've got some interesting session speakers. Um, I should say this is this session we're now looking at now uh, is one of three sessions um, on um, as part of a Medcom forum talking about how to succeed in medcoms despite what life throws at us so if you're watching this video as a standalone go and have a look on network pharma tv you'll find the other videos and and it's really worth it's been fascinating to hear the stories from individuals from professionals and now from the hr experts so um huge thank you to sharon and karen for joining us i'm going to ask you each to introduce yourself first your company yourself and then we're going to spend half an hour just talking about um from your perspective how do you support your staff um, and, and balancing supporting staff and wanting everyone to be happy with frankly making the business work, okay, which is the dilemma, I guess, at the heart of this. So, uh, Karen, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself first. Thank, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Karen Alderson. I work at Amiculum. I've been with Amiculum about two and a half years now, but I was working at another Medcoms agency before that. So, I've been in Medcoms for about 11 years now, and um, as well as my role in, in medical communications I'm a mom to two primary school age children so I can speak personally to some of the parenting challenges that have come with the pandemic um, as well as the kind of challenges and, and the opportunities we've sort of faced as an employer and I think it's been really useful if you listen to some of the other um, the panels that have been on today, it, it's, it's useful to highlight that there have been some significant challenges over the last couple of years, but there have been some gains as well in terms of how we work, how we communicate, how we develop people and work together as a team. So I think it would be useful to highlight, highlight some of that as well. So um, if I just tell you a bit about Amicula, we are an independent healthcare communications uh, company. We've got 11 agencies and over 300 team members across 13 different uh, locations globally. So as you can imagine, we have teams ranging in size, in lots of different locations, different time zones, all with different situations. And that's been uh, really interesting to, to, to handle and work with over the last two years, different sort of stages of the pandemic happening at different times across the world. So, um, so yeah, that's all kind of come into uh, the last couple of years. So it's been nonstop really for HR, as I'm sure it will be when Sharon talks about her situation and um, supporting managers and teams, adapting, flexing lots of processes and procedures, maybe developing training materials, lots of communication, lots and lots of listening. Um, and if that's something I can get across as much as possible today, it's about listening to people and their individual needs, um, making sure we can respond to those um, so we can kind of overcome any challenges, but also retain some of the more positive changes that, that might have happened as a result of what's kind of impacted um, everybody. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I would say that, you know, We've heard so much today. We've heard people with lots of different health needs. We have people with different personal situations and people with things going on outside of work isn't a new thing. Um, it's always been the case. People have caring responsibilities, families, um, health stuff, other things going outside of work that um, maybe an awareness of these sorts of things have been has been raised slightly. There's been a bit of a raising of empathy in some situations because everybody's found it difficult in one way or another um, but it's not a new thing um, and people are individuals so it's really important to see them as a whole person as an individual and, and communication and, and creating that environment of safety and, and support and trust where people can raise any concerns or questions they have and, and knowing they can do so without without judgment and that they will get the support they need so yeah, opening, open questioning, listening skills. Um, individuals, the employees are usually the biggest expert in themselves on what they need. So, you know, let's listen to them and, and do what we can. I guess that's my Fantastic. Idea. take. Okay, thank you very much, Karen. We'll, we'll explore a bit more of that in more detail in a moment. But Sharon, would you like to introduce your, yourself and Oxford Pharmagenesis? Yes, so Sharon Frost, I'm the Global HR Director at Oxford Pharmagenesis and I joined 
just over two years ago. So I do kind of consider myself a bit of a COVID joiner. Um, I literally was in the business for a couple of months before, well, about three months, I think, before um, we all then decided to, to work from home a couple of weeks before um, we were mandated to. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, I concur with much of what Karen just said there. We have we have seven offices with people attached to them. We have eight official offices in our business. Um, we also have a situation as a result of COVID where we have, you know, an individual working in Poland now, other people working out of New Zealand. So people moved either temporarily or permanently as a result of um, COVID. And I think, you know, one of the comments that, that Karen made there that, that I agree with wholeheartedly is, you know, we're now looking at the whole person, not just the person that presents themselves at work and making whatever we can work in a reasonable way happen um, so that we are able to retain our key talent we're all fishing in a very small pond for exceptionally talented individuals um, and we've seen some real benefits from the covid situation in terms of you know looking at people as true individuals and being able to consider that that whole person and i think um, for me the word that was almost applicable to every story was trust you know, if you don't have that trusting relationship, are you going to tell someone that you have this condition that may require you to, you know, have, you know, breaks from meetings or, you know, just adapt the way that you work from um, the what was a standard, you know, you come to work at nine and you finish at half past five and you have an hour lunch break, etc. That was that, that was certainly in 20 odd years of working the way that I had spent the vast majority of my my time working and I think now we're able to really think about what is the art of the possible for us working with each other rather than one person working for somebody else and I think that's been a real benefit um you know of course there's some horror stories and we've heard you know one or two today but I think where we can capture the positives and then take that on board for our future um, because I can see some real you know unknowns um, being real positives that, that ne were never imaginable um, happening as a result of the way that we as employers are now thinking so more positively and differently um, for that working with each other and being together um, rather than any kind of hierarchical um, relationship that, that certainly existed when I started in, in, <laughs> in my world of work 20 odd years ago. Okay. Okay. So look, we're going to have a freewheeling discussion here, and um, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and provoke some some interesting uh, comments here. Okay, uh, kick me back if I go a little bit too far. That's fine. Um, but uh, audience members, you also join in here and, um, and and ask some questions using the chat boxes. Okay. Um, just wanted to put an observ maybe it's an observation more than the question out. Um, and some context here, because I'm not quite sure who's watching this or whatever, okay. Um, I've been running Medcoms Networking for 15 years. We're in a very different place. The Medcoms business is very different now than it was 15 years ago. Um, agencies like yours have grown very rapidly and are much larger um, by definition. But you know what I mean? The, 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 the whole business though has matured. And I, I found that absolutely fascinating to watch. Um, so we are in a very different position. But your two agencies in particular have grown a lot in the last few years really yeah um but it's but but i suppose what i want to say is in medcoms generally there's a huge variety um, of agency types sizes very small agencies very large agencies um, let's just make the point i think we should make the point you two are both quite large fast growing independent agencies yeah um and 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 we're going to talk about your sort of environment and i just think it's worth making that point because there are going to be differences if you're a, a, a 10 20 30 person small startup sort of agency or boutique agency or you're a big global group of communications companies so i think we just need and, and i'm going to say frankly mm -hmm. i did try to get with a panel like this i try and get diversity on a panel, all right? Um, and unfortunately, Angela wasn't with us. So that's a slightly different sort of an agency. But actually, you've got a limited number of seats at the panel, as it were. I try and go for diversity. But in some ways, you are two quite similar, in some ways, agency types. Um, I also did try to get a chap on this panel and failed dismally. So I'm, just, <laughs> yeah, I'm partly just that, covering yeah. myself. <laughs> well, exactly. So but, but, uh, in HR, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think all I'm saying is, as we have this conversation, that I think people watching it should think about the fact that we 
are going to be talking about a certain sort of agency type environment by definition, although we have observations on, on others. OK, so my question actually to both of you, bearing in mind all of that, I hope I haven't rambled too long. But if you were sitting looking at either of your agencies five years ago, what sort of HR function was there? And, I, and I, I'm looking for some honesty here. I mean, you, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to put words in your mouth, but you know, and how, what's happened over the last five years and particularly in the last couple of years from an HR function point of view, because certainly 10, 15 years ago, you wouldn't have found many HR people really in medcoms. They were starting to appear, but they were more about talent acquisition and, and, and there were people looking after people, but HR has boomed within medcoms. I, Try and help me help me put some context on this because I don't want to sort of say the wrong thing or, or, or put words in your mouth. I, I'm going to go with Sharon first. All right. I just want a reflection, if you can, the, the see what I'm saying. Yeah. So I've only been in medcoms for two years. So we will probably give quite different responses, Karen and I, because obviously she's been in medcoms much longer. But if I look at what HR looked like 15 years ago, it was called the HR department and it was full of HR people. Um, HR at Oxford Pharmagenesis since I joined has changed dramatically. Um, so I joined two years ago and had a team of seven reporting into me and we're more than three times that now because what we have done is invested in the function that is investing and supporting our people. And I kind of work on a basis of divide to conquer. So we don't just have a talent acquisition department. We have a very large learning and development function as well. We have a function that looks after engagement and reward and recognition too. Um, and then we have our HR specialists. And we also are really connected with other groups, colleague groups within the business. So we have um, leadership management teams, we have um, employee forums, charity committees, mental health first aiders, EDI advocates and all of these groups we're working with because they are representative of certain groups, as well as obviously doing kind of engagement surveys for um, the mass to be able to sort of give their feedback in a, an anonymous way as well. Um, I think Oxford Pharmagenesis, I've only worked in Oxford Pharmagenesis in Medcoms, a real strength is that we still have many of the global leadership team, our executive team, who have been in the business for a very long time. So, our, you know, our chairman who founded the business is still very active and our CEO and COO have been in the business for a very long time. So they they really connected to when it was 20 or 50 people. And as we're growing, we've nearly doubled in the two years I've been in the business. Um, as we're growing, they're really helping us as an HR function, keep true to what we were about when we were that really small family feel business. And I think we're really working hard on maintaining that as, as, as you know, our DNA really and the heart of the, the heartbeat of our business. So, so we've got this quite um, interesting, from an HR point of view, interesting dynamic at play that really means that, that we need to invest in the HR department in order to really support our people to, to feel you know, that intention that, that our, our founder and CEO and COO have. Okay, and Karen, you 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 have been in Medcoms a while longer, and and you can compare and contrast a couple of different, very different sort of agency environments. So again, same basic question to you, but talk more generally about this sort of you know development of HR within Medcoms over the last few years. Yeah, um, no, I, I would see a lot more similarities across Medcoms agencies than differences. Actually, having worked in a couple, of, there are differences certainly, the differences in structures and sizes and. You know, policies and procedures, um, but certainly in terms of the way people you know, are treated and managed and things like this, you can see a lot of similarities. The industry drives probably how we work and what, what how we need to work with people. Um, I think in terms of the development of HR, it's, it's not a dissimilar answer to what Sharon said. It's it it's grown and developed according to. The, the growing and developing needs. So, for example, we we do have we have a careers team that focuses mainly on recruitment and, and kind of um, career opportunities for people coming into the business. And we have curriculum, our learning learning team, our learning platform, um, and they are technically separate teams, but we all work together very closely. So HR kind of links in and works really closely with their, them those two teams and um, as Sharon said with the leadership team and 
what you do find with, with a fast growing business is um, there, you know, you have to focus on the elements that retain that culture and the strength that, that you had at the start of it. So, and, and that comes through um, good communication, developing leaders and managers, because those people, the founders, they're not able to then be in contact with everybody as they would have done maybe 10 years ago, where they you know, basically sort of indirectly managed everybody in the business. And that's not, that's not possible when you get to 300 plus people and everybody's spread out. So um, I think probably what you were talking about is that HR maybe 10, 15 years ago was quite um, transactional, um, a lot about process, about, about kind of organisational, operational aspects of, of employment. And that has grown and developed into um, areas about people development, career planning, career development, um, recruitment, certainly talent acquisition is a huge part of the business um, because of the market we're in and, and how highly competitive it is. And that all has to link together as well. So if you're talking to candidates and talking about the business and what the culture is like and, and trying to attract people, then that's got to feed through and, and align with what you're creating as people come into the business as well and the experiences they're ha having. So, yeah, it's all kind of interconnected and, and um, you know, kind of, um, yeah, aligned across, okay. across the business. So, blunt question, do you think you have to be a certain size of agency before you have an HR function, meaningful HR function. Is there a reflection of size in that? Because it's quite a big investment, isn't it? You start up a new little agency, do you start by investing in the HR and the learning development and the training and all stuff, or do you just find some people who can get on with the job and, and get it done? So I, I just wonder, I'm trying to be slightly sort of flippant about it, but I just wonder whether you've got any views on, on that. Anybody? <laughs> I think it probably depends on, I mean. yeah, it probably depends on who's in the business and what, but, you know, as soon as you have a business, you have people in the business and you employ them, you have needs to provide for them. So there are employment needs, there are welfare issues, there are, um, you know, en engagement concerns and, and um, career development, learning and development, situ you know, things that they need. So all of that exists with or without a HR department. And I guess it's just a choice from business owners as to when they have somebody who's a specialist in that or whether they have people within the business that, that can manage all of that. But it all needs to be there, I think, it would be my answer. Okay, and same from you, Sharon, you're nodding away. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, it's about responding to the situation that you're in. There can be, you, you could have one agency that's 50 people that's quite happy to not have an HR function because you know, it's quite tactical operation, etc. You can have another that has got, you know, really ambitious individuals that in order to retain them, you're going to need to constantly be kind of growing them for them to thrive and, you know, and reach their potential. And therefore, some of these other things like reward and engagement and, and L&D are going to be far more important in that environment. So I think it it's one of those it depends answers. Yeah. And, and I think you've both touched on the fact that in, a, in an environment like we're in with Medcoms, where it's... Um, you're growing very fast the whole business is growing very fast and trying to recruit people um, and there are limited numbers of people out there um you know and you're all sort of fighting over some sort of experienced people that things like the, the the if i can call it the hr support to individuals by which i'm encompassing all the learning and development the training the coaching the mentoring everything else becomes a a really important factor that new recruits will look at I guess we're just going to agree with that. That's clearly an important part of it. Right, and, and, yeah, and in yeah. an environment like ours, where, where you are screaming out for people, it becomes very, very important, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's where it's important that the, 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 the lived experience matches what, what the, uh, you know, in our case, the careers team are, are talking to people and hiring managers are talking to people about so that they come in and they experience what they, what they have been expecting from through the process. Okay, so sticking with your, and I know I, I do feel we're talking about your environments here, but that's that's fine. We've already put the context on that. So in light of, particularly in light of some of what we've heard today, and we I mean, we all know, I mean, I grew up in an environment where, you know, we all knew we had our problems at home or we had stuff to deal with. But to be frank, we didn't, you know, and we weren't encouraged to talk about it. Um, you know, you get on with it. If you need to take a day off, then please don't. But if you have to go and take a day off and deal with it. Um, 
just talk a little bit around, and particularly what I'm interested in the last year or two is how much more open this has become. Um, you know, how and how much support do you find you're giving managers and and people in the organisation? I'm, I'm looking at it more from the point of view, not your lived experience. I'm looking at it from the point of view of you running a business, you managing a business, where you're providing the support to people who are providing support to the people. Do you see what I mean? How, how much? Yeah effort goes into that how much resource goes into that you know one of the things i was told very early on in the pandemic or, or it was observed was that the managers the spotlight is on the managers because it's you know it's one thing to see someone sitting in the corner of an office and go they don't look so happy so i'll sidle over and have a chat and whatever it's a completely different issue if you're managing from afar and i think that was a, that was a really important point that they made so i just wonder if you can talk a little bit about that how much you're supporting people to support people that makes sense uh, and I'm going to go with um, Karen first. Sorry, I should have. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just waiting here, nodding at each other. Yeah, who's <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I think the answer is a lot, actually. Uh, it is, you know, a manager's role, a line manager's role is incredibly important. And it is. it, it can be a tough role. Um, it's, you know, uh, there, there are lots of different pressures and lots of different responsibilities in that. I think... Um, I think we have supported people, uh, managers, in supporting their team members quite a lot, and it has increased certainly through the pandemic. There's been an increase in people um, having personal challenges as a result of that. Um, but there's been, um, you know, I do think that that awareness raising has been a good thing. So people being more open and being more uh, comfortable with discussing those because as you've as have been mentioned several times in the earlier panels if you don't know what the problem is you can't do anything to try and help it you can't can't resolve it and um, whilst it's not you know if somebody has a personal issue whether that be a health situation um family problems it's not their company's responsibility to resolve that issue that's certainly down to them to resolve it but anything that we can do to provide flexibility support and you know just listening ear just to know about it so that you aren't carrying the burden and trying to sort of muddle along with your issue and your work and everything at the same time all of that can go to helping that person and ultimately then that can mean they're they're more engaged and productive at work so it, it's not just a um, you know a kindness to people um although you know that 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 is an element of it but it is you know it reflects back in the business it means people are more productive it means we can all work better as a team so um, so I, th I think the fact that those issues have been raised more frequently, people are more vulnerable with each other. They're, you know, you're kind of coming into each other's homes, aren't you, and, and bringing your life to work um, a lot more. So, yes, we've had um, more managers coming and saying, right, I don't know what to do now. Somebody's got this issue. Can you help me with it? Um, and it's about providing that listening, hearing what they've got to say, providing support where you can, and also perhaps saying, I don't know how to support this. So um, in the case of um, mental health, for example, none of us in HR are mental health professionals. There is a, there's, there's a limit to where we can support with those situations. And the same goes for line managers. Um, and it's about making sure that it's an environment where people feel comfortable having the conversations and being able to ask the questions and um, talk about things without needing to know all the answers and being able then to, be, to, to signpost to other services, whether that service is provided by the company, employee assistance programmes and occupational health type schemes that, that um, a lot of companies have and we have, um, and where you know where you can kind of integrate those things. So I don't know if that answers the question, because I can't even remember no, what the question was. Don't worry, so don't I've worry. gone off I've on a tangent there. Don't worry, I've forgotten <laughs> myself. But I think it's just interesting listening to you talk. And I, I, I do find it interesting just talking about this stuff, because it's making us all think in our and then relating it to our own circumstances and so on. Um, but it was it was about the trade. It was it was it was it, what I was trying to get at was and it's been picked up. I think Helen was it was at Helen was talking about, you know, with, with the flexible working or home working, you know, how much more important is HR? And it's that what I was trying to get at was how much effort and resource you have to put into trade is supporting the people like the managers and so on who have to support the people who've got these problems uh, that's what i was trying and, and, and you did that's what i was trying to get at that was the root of the question but sharon have you you were nodding away again there i mean would yeah. you say anything different to that <laughs> oh i mean I, I agree with everything that karen said i think just to kind of further embellish it we, we have 
we have done a few quite tactical things as well. So we, we already had, I joined Oxford Pharmagenesis with a good number of mental health first aid as trained individuals. And we now probably have about a one to 20 ratio. Um, so we've really kind of upped that. And I think that has also been employee led, but they see a real value in being able to support each other. We also had and, and really make an effort to buddy every new starter with someone so they can ask those more incidental questions as well. And we're about to embark on things like mentoring and also coaching for line managers to really equip people with those vital skills to be able to help each other think outside of the box and not be kind of, oh, what does the rule book say, but actually make sure that they're kind of using their own discretion and treating people as individuals and knowing that they're supported behind the scenes by us in order to do that. We also launched um, you know, a very sort of tactical thing. We launched a new intranet and there's a whole section called My Wellbeing, for example, and um, packed with resources. And we try intermittently to have sort of topics meetings to identify and you know, really signpost people to those resources on an individual basis. But I think it has been a bit of a baptism of fire because, you know, LMD, for example, training was come to a, a big meeting room and we'll deliver some training to you. And all of the way that we've provided support in HR has had to change, you know, and um, and the way it's so it's not just what people are doing and where people are working, but it's how they they are working now and you know and and having those conversations to concur with Karen around you know don't just ask someone if they're okay and then on teams it's really easy to smile and go yes I'm fine <laughs> actually ask them three times you know yeah. ask them a question really you're, actually, you're not spying you're not prying you want them to know you've got your arm around them you've got their back and if they aren't right you are still able to help them and support them, even though it's through sort of technology, because it's really yeah, yeah. Easy to put on a show for the 30 minutes you've got a one to one with your line manager and, and that get missed. And I think, you know, um, I, I also feel that the, the, one of the positives is that people are, you know, the situation hit us so hard, so immediately, like a tsunami, that actually people did have to say, well, I've got I've got a six year old. How am I going to, you know, they're at home. How am I going to do today? <laughs> yeah. How am I going to organise myself? And so those conversations did, you know, did did come out early come on. Come out in the open. Yeah. 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 yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and I think that's for the good. And, and I think there'll be much more of that now. I mean, that was probably going to happen with Generation Z joining the workforce. Yeah. It's actually applying to everybody. And, 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 and I think that's a good thing. You know, we. Yeah. Um, when we, when we can remember going on an aeroplane, the first thing they tell us is self-care, put your own mask on first. We, we often have forgotten that in the workplace. And I think COVID has helped us remember we do need to think about ourselves a little bit. So even so being overly simplistic here, if we went back to what it used to be, the old normal, which I don't think we will, you know what I mean? But sort of, but, but some of this, this is the stuff we want to hang on to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Because these I techniques, think that, this thinking yeah, requires yeah. whatever. So yeah. Go on, Karen, sorry. Well. I think you mentioned a few things there that I thought were really helpful as well, like the, the sharing of resources and information and the communication. So, um, you know, we've got a list learning platform, but also we have a YAML, YAML uh, system as well. And that we there were more uh, more channels set up in YAML as a result of the pandemic that have continued. So there's social channels where people are connecting and um, I know during the pandemic, there was a great one that was actually set up by one of our leaders called homeschooling resources and people who were homeschooling would just throw ideas up and doing this today. This is what, I'm, you know, here's the result of my children. Try it yourself and just giving each other tips. And it, it kind of created a sense of community, um, you know, and um, kept everybody connected. But it also, I thought it was a very, very clear message to say, we know that you have stuff going on at home and we don't expect you to be 100% able to work in the same way that you usually do. So it kind of gave you that comfort that um, it's not lip service. Oh, don't, you know, just do what you can, do what you can. It was actually, actually, you know, really we understand that you've got these things going on. And obviously okay. parenting and homeschooling wasn't the only challenge. There's lots of other things, but that was just one example where I think, you know, those connections have been created and the continuance of that is important. Just out of interest, uh, and again, I've always got one eye on this because a lot of what I do is trying to attract people into the business. Um, so they've got no experience by definition, they're entry level, probably younger and so on. Do you see any ch particular challenges 
maybe that's the right way to put it, any particular challenges with bringing people in as opposed and supporting them as opposed to supporting the more experienced people who sort of know what they're doing. Again, can you just talk for a minute or two around that sort of issue? Karen, I'll start with you, but you see what I'm getting at there. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's different for different people. And it was it was great that um, Katia talked about the menopause. That's something that we've highlighted recently as well and provided advice and support to for, you know, for team members and managers. But, you know, other end of perhaps <laughs> the, the kind of age range, uh, younger people will have different needs and, and certainly, um, you know, homeworking, um, isolation from colleagues, not being in an office is seems to have been anecdotally a, a bigger issue for um, newer people into their careers who maybe can benefited or, or want to have more social interactions with people or perhaps a home situation didn't lend itself particularly well to working from home maybe in a shared flat um, you know and, and not having the kind of right setup for working from home so I think you know and then middle people like me who have young children and have had you know some challenges with that so everybody's an individual everybody has different needs and I think it's just about finding what's going to work to support each person to get the best out of them and make them feel the most encouraged and, and engaged and you know, until recently um people who were finding it difficult from home were able to go and work in safely in an office if they needed to um, you know, with COVID secure procedures in offices, um, obviously it all depends on what's going on and what, what the guidelines are from governments and in all different locations, you've got to keep mm-hmm. on top of that because they're changing constantly, but where we can, just providing different, you know, we can have resources that people can access when, when they need them in terms of advice and support, but we can also provide flexibility, it might be about providing a mentor it might be about you know all, all sorts of different things so it's that very individualized um communication and support that i think is really effective must have been interesting to see the sort of the, the the waves around the world in different offices you know it's all very well having a policy but in our country yeah. now the rules have changed sharon the same question though to you in terms of the the the, the entry level i mean do you see particular challenges with them um, Yeah, I think there's been a couple for an entry level person joining, you know, they may have chosen to, you know, go to London and, 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 you know, have a bit of a London life and then COVID happened and so they actually are in a bedroom and they're not going out and experiencing London. So we've had a number of people that have then reverted back to living with their parents up in Yorkshire or wherever, you know, and and had to recognize that that would be something that might support them better than them being trapped in a room in a stranger's house and not being able to go out and and have the experience that they they signed up to beyond the work. I think also helping people understand where the office is and what it is and, you know, opening it up to those people that, you know, even if it was just to go and have a look, not that you need to go to the office to work because you're in a a bedroom in a house, but actually because you've never worked in an office and people are talking about the office, but you don't know where the loo is or, you know, where where the meeting rooms are, et cetera. And so just being able to visualize your workspace when people are then talking about it helps you connect with them as well. The bigger issue I think was around onboarding new recruits that haven't had that experience and line man supporting line managers with how to onboard and train and you know giving and receiving feedback through teams is very different from sharing the air and being in the same room as someone and just being able to help them adapt and also explain to that new recruit that this is different for me too. We wouldn't normally be taking three hours to go through this. We'd normally sit in a room and probably do it in 30 minutes, but it's going to take longer because we're having to do it differently. And so I'm kind of learning with you or I'm having to adapt and do it different, not because of anything connected to you, just because of the situation in which we're in. And so it has been more difficult for everyone in that respect, I think. And then still trying to manage the career aspirations of obviously early on, people are promoted in medcoms quite quickly. And so still trying to meet that ambition because it doesn't disappear just because COVID's happening. And so, you know, managing everything so that we set people up for success, I think has been a real driving, you know, but okay. conversation has been important. Again, I'm mindful of time and we're gonna wrap this up in the next minute or two, but uh, again, absolutely fascinating. We could go in lots of different directions here, but we picked up or, or one of the comments made in the previous sessions, particularly listening to the sort of the individuals as it were, was how important it is to be open and to talk 
you know, I mean, I guess from, I suppose what I'm, I, I, you're just going to nod at me, but, you know, from your point of view, the message is, if you've got problems, talk about it. Problems, you know, in the widest context. I, I guess it's as simple as that. If you hide it, then we can't help you sort of thing. Yeah, I saw a great infographic on LinkedIn this morning that was actually talking about equity rather than equality. And it was an image of four people with the same size bike. Um, and then the four people again, but with the disabled adjusted bike, yeah. with the, the man had the same bike as the top image, and the woman had a slightly smaller one, and the child had a miniature bike kind of thing. And I think it's about people knowing that we where we can adapt to you as an individual, we will. You know, it, you know, ask because it might be possible. And 20 years ago, people didn't ask. And I, you know, I really encourage people to ask because I think, you know, we all want to all of us wherever you are in your career want to continue to grow and thrive and, and perform because you all feel like you're part of something you know we work okay. with each other as I said at the beginning not for and uh, okay. so okay. getting that message across I think is vital particularly to entry level people okay and, and Karen just to wrap this up I mean as a logical extension of that we are looking at a much more diverse workforce I mean you know it, I'm trying to be, I'm oversimplifying a massive topic, but you know, is that just a fair comment? You know, this is a, a rapidly growing business and we're embracing different ways of working and that is going to lead as night does today to a much, much more diverse workforce. Is that is that a simple but appropriate headline? Mm -hmm. to yeah, I mean, it will certainly lead to, lead to more diversity, but there are things that you can do to promote that further, I think. I think, you know, obviously bigger workforce, Bound to be more uh, diversity of people within it but that doesn't it doesn't follow exactly in that way so I think you know having open policy it was interesting okay. somebody mentioned earlier about you know oh, when should I mention my disability well actually if you ask without <laughs> in certain in terms of saying do you need any adjustments at your interview do you need any support to attend this interview can you know can open the door but it isn't saying you must tell me about any of these any disabilities right. that you have in order to progress with this interview so it's you know it's the, it's the way that you ask and the way that you communicate and I do yet yeah, just to make one last point I think yes be open and talk about what your needs are but it's about creating organizations creating the environment where that feels comfortable and you know that we are open and non-judgmental and accepting of those questions and those comments as well so people aren't just going to come in and go oh I'll just tell you everything if, if they yeah. don't feel uh, comfortable to do so okay 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 so look guys there's so much more we could talk about but I am going to draw a line there um, and say a huge thank you to you two for joining in and talking so thank openly. Uh, thanks to the audience for joining in. Um, if anybody's got any, I'm sure you're very happy for me to say, you know, people can contact you via LinkedIn yeah, and, sure. and, and so on. Yeah. Part of the point of these webinars is to get people connecting with each other. So thank you so much for joining. The audience, thank you for joining in. Um, I'm going to wrap up the recording now just with a, a quick goodbye. If anyone's interested in what we're doing, go to medcomsnetworking.com and you'll find lots of information, resources about the Medcoms business. So quick wave, guys. And We'll stop the recording there. Thank you very much.